Welcome to Engineering Influence podcast by the American Council of Engineering Companies, uh, coming to you live from our 2019 Fall Conference in Chicago. And I'm extremely pleased and honored to be uh, joined by the CEO of Zipline, Keller Ronaldo. He's going to be speaking to the group um, today. And he is the CEO of an extremely innovative company that's changing lives in areas of the world where really technology can really make a difference immediately in people's lives. Zipline's ultimate goal is to be able to put each human on the planet within 15 to 30 minute delivery window of any essential medical product that they need, no matter where they live. Uh, how do they do that? They do that by drone delivery. Um, and it's innovative. It's, it's using ra- you know breaking technology and applying it to a direct social need. Um, Keller, thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate it. And uh, where did this idea generate from? What's your background and how did Zipline come about? Uh, well, my background is in robotics and entrepreneurship and biotechnology. I, we, when we started building everything that became Zipline in late 2013, we had a pretty good sense that automation was going to have a huge impact on logistics. It seemed pretty obvious. I mean, you had seen these Kiva robots, for example, running around inside Amazon warehouses and and other e-commerce warehouses, and it seemed like very, very clear that somebody was going to build that for outside the warehouse. Mm -hmm. It was suddenly going to become possible to start moving things around in the world in in a much more automated, fast way. And for us, it seemed like we had an opportunity to make sure that that technology, as it um, developed and came into the real world, that it served all humans equally. And the reason that mission was exciting to us was that five and a half million kids die every year due to lack of access to basic medical products. And so although often technology is only serving the richest people on the planet, and then it sort of trickles down to everybody else, we thought there was a pretty good opportunity to start with the highest need population, start with the countries that where, where logistics is most challenged today, and kind of leapfrog to a completely new way of doing things. And in fact, it's been those countries that may not have access to like DHL, UPS, FedEx, Mm -hmm. that are the most, um, a lot of times that are the most ambitious, the most willing to do something new. And so that's helped us from um, a government partnership front, from a regulatory front, it's allowed us to operate at national scale and save thousands of lives um, much faster than any other company. And right now you're operating a lot in Africa, um, in areas that, like you said, don't have the infrastructure, don't have the uh, the ability to get uh, packages delivered in, in, in you know same day delivery or or in short order. Um, but really, what you have now is a situation where a, a doctor can use an application, um, essentially make an order for medical supplies. Um, those are put onto a drone, and then it, it is just flown right over to the area where that medical supply is airdropped into the area of most most need. Yeah, it's pretty simple. I, you know, we use these small autonomous aircraft that weigh about uh, 40 pounds. And it's essentially press a button on a smartphone and then receive the delivery that you need 15 to 35 minutes later. I, although we're taking advantage of a lot of technology on the back end to make that experience possible, the experience for the user or the doctor or the nurse is really, really simple. Push yeah. a button, get what you need. And, you know, the, the in most of the countries where we're operating, there are good roads to the hospitals that we mm-hmm. serve, but um, there, there just aren't the same level of like international logistics yeah. networks. In fact, I mean, these, these really good international logistics networks really only serve the golden billion people on the planet. So mm-hmm. there are 6 billion people out there who, as you said, don't have access to even same day delivery, let alone kind of like instant delivery of something that you'd need to save someone's life. And something that we were talking about before we went on about... Um opportunities of, of, I guess, places in the world that are more willing to be innovative and to um, adopt new technologies because they have an immediate need and they see a potential solution and they want to field that solution as fast as possible, which is why you've, you've decided to really partner with countries that are, that are willing to take on this technology. You know, in your experience in talking to uh, governments and let's say just emerging economies or these countries that don't have that same ability of of of, uh, of um, you know transportation and logistics um, dealing with them compared to the United States and some of the Western countries that are still trying to 
Figure it out. Figure it out and figure out drones, you know, and, and that apprehension that people have to say, okay, well, drones, you know, we look at UPS, we look at, you know, Amazon, um, and sometimes overlook technology that can be put into need for social good. Mm-hmm. I mean, for sure, a big part of the success of what we've done so far has been these partnerships we've been able to build with government. There's a lot of trust there. Yeah. Um, we formed direct relationships often with you know, the president, the minister of health. Uh, we shared a vision for universal access to health care in a way that really only works in systems. I mean, it's a lot easier to get started in a country with a public health care system yeah. versus a fragmented private one like you have in the U.S., um, and, and so with those advantages, we were able to get to national scale in about a year with mm-hmm. this kind of kind of radical new technology. Uh, and the other thing is that I think people often don't appreciate. I mean, you know, the U.S. led the way in terms of automobiles or airplanes or you know, the space industry. But uh, that's not necessarily that paradigm is not going to last forever. Yeah. And with uh, this sort of technology, which is obviously um, needs to be controlled from a regulatory perspective somehow uh, it's actually a lot of countries that are smaller faster moving a little more willing to take risk that are benefiting disproportionately from the early versions of the technology yeah and uh, and so although we got started for example in Rwanda and Ghana it is the case we're, we're, we're quite um, optimistic about the US and the FAA yeah. uh, following along quite quickly the FAA is very ambitious and it, it wants to make sure that the US isn't falling behind in terms of fundamental new technology and uh, not only that, but we now have tens of thousands of hours of safe flight data, yeah. which is really helpful, too, because sharing that with a regulator can do a lot to uh, alleviate any concerns they have about the technology or the safety. Have you been up on uh, Capitol Hill to talk to members of Congress? And, and, and what's their reaction been when you, when you kind of give them um, you know, your, your case studies of success? Many times uh, we've we've you know been to the Senate and to the House to to talk to all different members you know across the political aisles and uh, I mean in in general it's pretty e- the nice thing about what we do is it's very easy to understand it's like <laughs> yeah. not a complicated idea yeah. you know like universal access to healthcare use technology to provide the same level of access that you have in a city mm-hmm. to people who live in rural and suburban areas yeah. and if someone is um, if someone needs something instantly. Today, they can get, likely in the U.S., a hamburger delivered to them instantly, but they yeah. can't get, like, an asthma inhaler. Mm-hmm. They can't get naloxone if you're having an opioid overdose. These yeah. things are, obviously, they should be delivered via an instant logistics network. And so anybody, um, anybody you know, on Capitol Hill can understand that. And I think in general, especially the people in Congress, look at what's happening in these other countries and say, oh my God, our responsibility is to make sure that the U.S. does not fall behind in terms yeah. of this fundamental new kind of technology. Yeah, and it's a question of falling, falling, the threat of falling behind and not being um, as leading edge as we could be, but also realizing that there are areas of the country in the United States that could benefit from a system like this. Definitely. Not, not everyone is on an interstate. Not everyone can get um, uh, uh, can be reached. If you're living in an Appalachia or if you're living in a, in a remote area uh and you need immediate assistance yeah no i mean health universal access to healthcare is not just a challenge in like yeah. some part of the world it's a challenge mm-hmm. in every part of the world i mean the u.s has the highest rate of maternal mortality of any developed country in the world uh people who live in certain rural areas of the u.s actually have a um have a significantly lower lifespan than average across the country yeah. i mean this is a very clear sign that our healthcare system is failing certain geographic segments mm-hmm. of the U.S. population, and we think that we can use technology to equalize those differences yeah. and save lives in doing so. Absolutely. And, of course, you'll be speaking to the group um, today. What we have, of course, you're going to be speaking to a, a room of engineers from different disciplines, um, people who are engaged with drones. They, they've, I've talked to a lot of CEOs who kind of, for example, they do a lot of, um, you know, bridge inspe- inspection. They've realized that they can do a lot more uh, efficiently with drones, and, and, and that's become a, uh, a new technology that, that the engineering industry is, of course, adopting. Um, so they're familiar with the idea and the concept. Uh, what's the message that you're going to carry to them? What do, what do you want them to kind of leave the room thinking about? Uh, you know, I, I think one, one of the most important things that come out of my experience over the last six years is just probably doing anything fundamentally new, especially what we do. I mean, it looks so weird and sci-fi the first time we talk to a partner or to a customer or to a patient. Uh, 
I think you realize that our intuition for what's possible from a technological perspective is, is actually not very good. Our mm-hmm. intuition only tells us what has been done in the past. And the reality is when we got started, you know, flying in Rwanda, most of our customers, I mean, it looked like completely insane what we were doing. And a lot of experts in global public health told us there was no way this was going to work. Yeah. Like the technology wouldn't work. Doctors wouldn't want it. There's no way countries would pay for it. I mean, every possible thing <laughs> they could, you know, the, it's just it so was, new. It's just, it's, it's, right. they've never seen it before. So right. it's like, how could this people possibly work? Exactly. People and people really didn't believe. And the thing that uh, finally convinced us, because that was pretty discouraging to us in the early mm-hmm. days, the thing that finally convinced us was talking to ministers of health. Yeah. These were the people who really understood the problem and could say, look, like, it, even if we were to just do this with blood, we could have a huge impact on maternal health. We, we are not able to get the blood types to where they need to go to get patients transfusions, to get moms transfusions when they need them when they're giving birth. Um, and it was that kind of clarity of the problem that we wanted to solve that convinced us, let's go ahead and try it, even though all these experts are telling us it won't work. And of course, you know, for that first week of actually delivering to a hospital, the doctors told them, told us, it's as though Jesus Christ is delivering blood from the sky. I mean, it, it's extremely weird yeah. for, these, for these doctors to be able to push a button on a smartphone and then re- receive a product via an autonomous aircraft. And then on day eight, it's like totally boring and yeah. old hat. And people are like, of course we have drones that deliver medical products. Like, how else would you solve that problem? Yeah. And uh, so it's amazing how quickly something goes from science fiction to entitlement yeah. and boring. Mm-hmm. And that's the magic of technology. It's, yeah. the, like, it's exciting for seven days, and then after seven days, it's like, And then yeah, it's boring. It's boring. Yeah, yeah of course we have yeah. that. And so, yeah, that, that, that's a really, really good point because it's gotten to that point now where it's like everything that's like, you know, well, the old joke is where's my flying car, right? It's like, yeah. you know, after all this time, why don't we have it? Then when we finally get it, we're going to be like, okay, well, what's next? Whatever, what's next? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and that's a good that's a good idea because a lot of people are like, okay, well, this is a challenge. This is an opportunity. It's so new. It's scary. I don't know if it's time to do this. And then all of a sudden, by the time you get into it, you realize, oh, it's not scary at all. Actually, yeah. this is kind of mundane. And, and this is this, you know, you're going to have doctors saying, why is my delivery later? Or, or, exactly. or you know, why can't I get this immediately? Um, so that's, that's interesting. I think, I think you're going to have a, a, a very receptive audience because people are looking at, um, of course, in, in, in the industry at large of um, how technology is impacting, of course, what they do and, what opportunities there are to kind of expand into new areas. So I think you're going to get some, uh, some, some interesting questions for the audience afterwards or just, you know, just a lot of, a lot of interest in, in, in your talk. So um, I really do appreciate, I know you have a packed schedule, um, and uh, I really appreciate your time. Again, uh, Keller Ronaldo, he's the CEO of Zipline. It's uh, flyzipline.com. Yep. Uh, really check it out because it's transforming lives today in areas of the world that um, need it most. And it's a perfect example of how innovation and technology can meet a social good and and change lives for the better. Thanks for having me. Killer, thank you very much. Thanks. Take care.